Hello everyone, and welcome to Shay's Art Hour. Today I took a wonderful trip to the Norton Museum of Art in West Palm Beach, Florida. And honestly, I was completely surprised by the collection. Name a famous artist and they had one there. This evening, this beautiful Thursday evening, I wanted to take a look at some of my favorite paintings from what I saw today. I didn't see everything, but I thought it would be interesting to talk some of these over and hopefully I can edit this in such a way as to where the paintings will fit above my head so everyone can see them, but they will also be included in, in the post. So the first thing I wanted to look at was um, a landscape by Wu Hong from the 18th century in China. He was one of the eight masters of Nanjing, um, very famous landscape artist, at least for his time. And I didn't quite get <clears throat> the name of this piece, but I did get the inscription of the poem. But let's just take a look at the composition real quick, shall we? So unlike a lot of other landscapes from the Qing Dynasty, from the 18th century, and unlike a lot of other work that Wu Hong put out, this is a relatively compact and, and stout landscape, I would say. You know, the cliffs sort of hang above the tiny subjects down below. And there is a mountain in the distance, but a lot of what's going on here is just sky. Um, contrast that with the sort of mountains and these, these tall, vertical landscapes that a lot of other Chinese masters put out in this time. <clears throat> if you look in the bottom right-hand corner, there are two figures which are included. Um, a figure is, is very often included, especially in vertical Chinese landscape, because it gives the... It gives the, the work a sense of scale, right? But there are two figures down here. There's one guy carrying something, and what that something is might be elucidated in a second. And then he has like a little servant down there, someone following him. Um, but unlike, again, in a lot of Chinese landscapes, it doesn't seem to be that the implication is that, you know, in some Confucian sense, the figures are going to surmount what's ahead of them or climb the mountain or whatever. Rather, they're they're very close to what seems to be a little village nestled in in between the cliff to the right and then the sort of rock formation to the left. Um, and so what, what seems to be happening here is that instead of sort of inviting challenge like a lot of Confucian vertical landscapes, this one seems to suggest a kind of repose, which is very interesting. And is, it is typical in Chinese landscapes, but the, the, the implication of a challenge in the vertical sense is not really here. The poem at the top of the scroll reads, um, while embracing the harmonious nature of windswept pines and flowing water, the zither arrives, but there is no need to pluck it. Ninth month of 1762 in the beauty and spirit of Li Xiangxi, brush for Mr. Shouwong. Um, the poem does imply a very similar theme as to the composition, which is, you know, the zither arrives, but there's no need to pluck it. The zither is a very traditional Confucian instrument that is often associated with merrymaking and, and celebration in a certain sense, um, but also of a certain connection with those around you and with those in the group. You know, someone would bring out the zither and sing a song, and it was a time for communal recognition and a time to get along with everybody. Here, the zither player, who might be the figure in the bottom right corner, hey, he has arrived to the village, but there's no need to pluck it um, because it's unnecessary, because whatever the zither invites, whatever social need it fulfills is already here. No one is going to climb the mountain. The zither doesn't need to be played. We are content. And I like this because it's very odd for a Chinese landscape, especially during the Qing Dynasty, especially during this era of the Qing Dynasty, where, well, maybe it's not so strange because it's, you know, maybe it's fair to say that by 1762, things weren't going so well for the, for the Qing, or at least wouldn't be very soon. Um, artists can have their pulse on very strange and nascent things that no one else could realize. <clears throat> The second work we'll look at is uh, Christ in the Garden of Olives by Paul Gauguin. 
um, I had seen this painting before and I quite liked it and I didn't realize that it would be here in the Norton. I mean, it's like a hundred million dollar painting and it's beautiful, of course. Um, to a certain extent, everyone knows that this painting is supposed to be somewhat autobiographical. Um, Gauguin was very disappointed after some of his paintings weren't received very well in, in several exhibitions. Um, but this is, you know, for portraying Christ in the Garden, this is, this is also an interesting work for several reasons. One, our Lord is holding something and I can't quite tell what it is. Is it writing? Is it is it a cup? Is it a rag? Whatever it is, he seems to be wringing his hands with it. His hair is also red, which gives even more than than usual a sense of a sense of uniqueness to the figure um, in the left. And he looks down, which I think is usual. But unlike other depictions of Christ in the garden, he is not prostrate, you know. There is a despair, perhaps, but there is not a, a you know, innumerable, unquantifiable agony. And what else is interesting is that, you know, typically in the biblical story of Christ in the garden and in portrayals, you know, the, the, the disciples, uh, who was it, Peter, James, and John, James Major, are there sleeping. In this depiction, there's only two figures, and they're not asleep. In fact, they seem to be hurrying away from Christ. Um, their faces are unclear, especially the figure to the left, but the figure to the right seems to be cloaked in a certain kind of way and also seems to be looking back at Christ as he flees the garden. Um, this is very, you know, it takes sort of the themes of what happened, especially at the beginning of the Passion, and sort of it, it, it tilts them in a certain way, you know, Christ is not prostrate, but also he is being abandoned before the arrest even happens. And I think this speaks to Gauguin's frustration at that time, you know. He sees himself as a Christ-like figure, as someone who is worthy of praise. And he's not, he's not bleeding over it, so to say, but he's upset and he feels abandoned um, in a similar way. Uh, the composition is also interesting insofar as, you know, there's, there's a tree that runs right down the middle of the painting and Christ sits on the left side and the, and the fling, you know, presumably the disciples sit on the left side or, you know, are positioned on, on the right side, excuse me. You know, this invites an interpretation of something like there are two worlds. Um, there's a division between the main figure portrayed Christ and the people who are running away from him. They exist in two separate frames. There's something that perhaps they don't understand about each other. Next, we will look at perhaps, um, let's look at this one. This is called Let a Thousand Flowers Bloom, and it is by Ansem Keffer from 1998. Now, when I read the title for this painting, I already knew what it was about even before reading the description. You know, Let a Thousand Flowers Bloom, that's a title of a Maoist cultural campaign um, from the 50s, I believe. And this painting is gorgeous. I mean, just looking at the, at the field of flowers themselves, they are poppies, which invites a certain kind of interpretation, a, a troubling one, if anything, um, because poppies, you know, no one cultivates a field of poppies because they look nice. Um, there's an implication of death in such an image, especially when you look at the top of the painting and there's this sort of black horizon that, that reaches down into the field below, which could be rain. I think that's a fair interpretation, but it's very nasty. It's very thick. Um, there's a pessimism there, I think. And <clears throat> the poppies shoot up out of the ground. The thousand flowers are blooming. And of course, to their left, an addendum to the field, there's a statue of, of the man himself, our chairman, and his face is not shown. But the pose is still recognizable for some reason. And with his, and he's a statue too, which is very interesting. But as his hand is positioned, the, the flowers, it almost seems like he calls the flowers out of the ground. Um, you know, we can talk a lot about the Hundred Flowers campaign and exactly what happened there and what the artist might be calling upon here because there are certain despondent signifiers within the portrait. Um, and yet there's a power 
you know, because, because Mao is represented as a statue and faceless, might I add, which is very interesting, there, there seems to be an interpretation of cultural memory at play. Um, it is not the man himself, but rather what he symbolizes, even though he was alive, obviously, when he called for the hundred, the thousand flowers campaign. There, there's a memory here that causes all these poppies to bloom. And notably, especially as, and you know, as you approach the background of the painting, the poppies sort of blend together in this odd way. You know, Thousand Flowers was about this idea that if we can let differences in, in opinion and cultural signification bloom, then we will find the right one. And yet, even though such expansiveness is being called upon by the figure to the left, it is muddled and it is nasty. And it's really not vibrant. Um, white, black, and brown with a smidge of red for the flower field does not necessarily call upon prosperity, even though there are a lot of things growing. There is an implication of death um, in the subject matter themselves. Uh, I quite like this painting. I almost fell to my knees when I saw it. Um, now we'll take a look at uh, this, this Picasso. Um, this one was called A Bust of a Fawn or something like that, I think. And I quite like it because, you know, the idea of the satyr in Western myth is familiar to everyone. But here it's taken in an odd sense where it's like it's almost, because of the way that the mask sits on the subject, it's, it's, it, it's almost called into, into question. Its authenticity is called into question. What's interesting here, and, you know, it's probably not out of character for a, a certain kind of Picasso painting is that the 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 subject if we if we remove if we refuse to consider the mask for a second the head is tilted to the right and you can tell this because of the way that the shadow is set on the neck and on the side of the head as well as the way that the ears are sort of positioned you know this is this is a certain kind of portraiture where we're sitting like this and yet the mask is positioned squarely onto the face right it, it has been imposed here even though the subject faces towards the artist's left, or the viewer's left. <clears throat> so what does this mean? Well, you know, you look at the mask, and on one hand, it is it is divided in two, which I think, you know, certain things can be called into question. The one on the left, the left or the leftmost half of the mask, seems to be very somber, while the one on the right seems to be impassioned or confused in a certain sense. And so one does get the interpretation or the, the idea when looking at this painting that something has been laid on to the subject. Or even if they have donned such a mask willingly that something is missing or that something hasn't been aligned quite properly. You know, there's a way, if this really is a satyr that's being portrayed, the way that it's being represented and the way that it's being received is not perfectly clean and cut and dry. You know, the mask hasn't been able to be absorbed into the face in such a way that the viewer cannot tell it's a mask. What's also interesting about this painting is that it really, you know, the, the, the subject is upright. It really does seem to be like a satyr, especially because of the ears and the horns, which all seem to emanate from whatever is being portrayed behind the mask. There's still something that must be overlaid. And what is that? Is it human? It might be. The mask casts a, a brown shadow onto the face, at least it seems that way. Um, and yet there's something that's being misconstrued. There, you know, this mythic object of peace and tranquility is, is not being received in, in such a way. And I just find that very interesting. Um, next, we'll look at this Basquiat, which is the first Basquiat I've ever seen, and it was it was glorious. Um, this is it's untitled, but I believe it's referred to as Prophet One. And what's interesting about this painting is that unlike a lot of other Basquiats, um, the subject, which seems to be the face in the top of the painting, he has no body. The face just sort of floats above whatever nonsense is going on down here below um and unlike some other Basquiat's there there's there 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 are scrawls there's something on here but they're not letters um and 
whatever is happening in the bottom half of the painting. There, it's some sort of chaotic violence, sure. What's interesting is that the head sort of, if you look at the line work, specifically what's surrounding the face, it, because of, of this, this line in the center here, which is curvy, the face seems to sort of sneak in from the left side of the painting, right? And in an odd sense, it reminds me a lot of, of Munch's The Scream, you know, ah! Because of the way that the line work is happening, it, 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 it bounds the face on both sides, on the cheeks and sort of with the way that the face is held. Um, in the face itself, there's something coming out of its mouth. It looks like a tongue or something like that. And of course, the line work, as on all Basquiat faces, is very interesting and sort of chaotic and, and yet leaves one with the impression that, you know, it is, it is a completed thing and this is how it should appear. Um, I think the title does a lot of illuminating here. Well, and, and one more comment about sort of the way that the color works. In the top left half of the painting, basically in, in, the, in the top left corner of the, of the frame itself, there is white, right? And though there's black on the left, there's black on the bottom and on the top right half, but in the left there is white uh, as the primary background color, which leads to a sense of perhaps whatever is being portrayed as rising above something that's below it. Um, <clears throat> I think the title's quite illuminating in this case because unlike some, some of the other Basquiat subject matter, again, there's no body here. And in fact, if there was no face in the painting at all, it would be very difficult to understand what's happening and we would have to move into sort of a more abstract interpretation. Um, but the face is there and it rises above the chaos, or it's, it is at least positioned above the chaos or within the chaos as the main subject matter. And it's hollering, you know, it is not content. And yet it is positioned here in a position of perhaps authority, of perhaps surmounting something. And it hollers and it hollers something out. This is how prophets operate. This is how visions operate. Something appears, something demarcatable, something not recognizable, but something, something that is, that can be seen, appears above chaos and it hollers something. And whatever's being hollered, whatever's being, you know, portrayed may not be understood. And yet it is there. And yet it is our job to, to take that as something that's important. I quite like this painting. This is going on for longer than I thought. We have three more to look at. This next one is, um, an Edward Hopper painting. It's called The City in August. Um, it's a portrayal of a uh, New York townhome in Riverside Park, I believe, um, at a time when the city is quite abandoned, when people, you know, it becomes a certain time of the year when people, certain kinds of people in the city leave their property and go elsewhere. What's happening in this one is very interesting. I mean, it's beautiful because it's a Hopper. Um, it's very obvious that the sort of pleading statue at the center of the frame is, you know, the main subject of, of the painting. Um, and one feels bad for her because one knows that she's alone. Um, there's also a sense of voyeurism here insofar as, as the curtains are opened, you know, and she is not looking directly out of the viewer. She sort of looks out towards the street, um, pleading for perhaps someone to come join her in this forsaken apartment, and yet we as the viewer are sort of positioned in a way that she can't see. What else is interesting about this painting is that the entrance to the home, it's this big red door with this relief on top, it, it, it winds down a driveway to be able to, to if, you, if one was to decide that they wanted to join the statue, they would have to curve down this road and sort of go below to enter the house. And this to me seems quite sinister. I wouldn't go in this house. Even the shadow work here too, you know, it's a very bright day, it's a, it's a pleasant subject matter, and yet the way that the driveway works and the angle that it works and the shadow work give a very subtle suggestion that maybe one shouldn't want to enter this house and maybe the house has been abandoned for good reason. The final two we'll look at are historical. This one is very interesting to me. It's, it's an immaculate conception. Um, I don't remember who painted it. Um, 
and I'll never know because there's a million Immaculate Conceptions out there, but you know, let's look at Our Lady in this portrait. Uh, her face is, is quite interesting because uh, it seems a bit, a bit rounder than what a lot of other people were doing, especially in Immaculate Conception paintings with their sort of sense of verticality and things like that. Um, and I believe this was an earlier one um, from the date, if I'm not mistaken. But the most interesting thing to me here is that the Puti, um, in the bottom left-hand corner, um, one of them is holding up a mirror. And this is not anything you'll see in, in really any sacred image work, um, let alone a portrait or, or, or a portrayal of the Immaculate Conception. And what's notable, too, is that, you know, Our Lady, she, she looks away from it. She almost looks in the opposite direction that her reflection is being cast, and she won't look at herself in the mirror. Um, this is also an interesting Immaculate Conception because Our Lady does not stand on the world. Rather, she stands on a cloud um, and steps out with her left foot to stand on a reverse crescent moon, which is also odd. Um, but yet she still manages to, to trample the serpent while doing that. So... This, of course, is all Immaculate Conceptions. You know, there's something very triumphant being portrayed, which I think is good. But there's also something strange. I think we as art viewers are very reluctant to interpret the putty, the putty, which are these little baby cherubs that, that sit around Our Lady. Um, as, you know, it's very easy to interpret them as purely benevolent creatures, especially because they're, you know... Raphael and his perverted ass decided that they were like angels or whatever and then you know in the right hand corner they one holds lilies and but the idea that one would hold up a mirror to our lady and she would refuse to look at it seems a bit odd to me and rather instead of supporting her as a lot of pooty do in portrayals of the immaculate conception they sort of float around her and they're, they're, they they sort of seem to just bear witness to what's happening, to the conception of Our Lady, to, well, and you know, it's interesting too, looking at this portrait right now, or this painting right now, excuse me, the, the trampling of the serpent is something that no one knows is going on. None of the pooty look at it. It is off to the side. It's sort of done extraneously. She steps out with her foot to do it, right? And none of the pooty look at her. So it seems to be, you know, if whatever they are, whatever sort of thing they represent, they're unaware of the triumph of the Immaculate Conception. And a lot of them seem rather concerned with one another. You know, the two in the right hand are fighting over lilies, which doesn't make them seem very well either, especially because we know what lilies mean. So I really like this one because it's a rather, it, of course it's still triumphant, but there, there are interesting things happening in this Immaculate Conception with regards to the spectators of what Our Lady has accomplished um, in being immaculately conceived. Finally, let's look at this this last one. This is The Temptation of St. Anthony um, by Jan Wellens de Kock. Great name. And I and I came up and I looked at this and I was like, oh, is this a, is this a Bosch? Like, it looks exactly like a Bosch. But no, it's not. Um, rather, it is a... Um, he, de Kock was a student of Bosch's. Um, and so that's why the subject matter is very similar. You'll see all these demons running around and whatever. And, you know, to avoid going on too long about portrayals about the, tempta the temptation of St. Anthony, it's always very odd to me that, that what's happening in the temptation a lot of times, especially in visual art portrayals towards the early modern period in the Renaissance, you know, in, in early, in, in medieval depictions of his temptation what's happening a lot is there's some sort of seductive woman or there's these demons dancing around and saint anthony's like no i won't look at them i refuse to look at them and that's still what's happening here to a certain extent you'll see that all these demons are running around and that you know the seductress comes into the frame on the right hand side but you know saint anthony just looks at his bible and his rosary and he you know he is not looking at the temptation but it's also odd to me that in this very flemish boschian style um, which a, a lot of the temptations around this time period were, were portrayed in, there's all these, you know, the, the, the house is on fire. There's all these creatures running around. And if you take the time to look at them, a lot of them are very interesting. There's a leg hanging from the tree in the left-hand side. Um, in the bottom left-hand corner, there's like a face tied to a leg that holds a broom. We love the Bashian demons, don't we, folks? But I, I've always been a bit confused as to how 
such things were to be tempting. Um, and yet the temptation is here, and in, in, at least more obviously in, in, in the right-hand section of, of the work, um, wherein the temptress derives, right? But it's a bit of an odd portrayal of the temptress as well, because, you know, I mean, if I were in 16th century Flanders, perhaps, and I was a woman, perhaps I would have covered up my chest a little bit more. But she wears, she wears a headdress. She wears a veil, for that matter. And there's, there's really not any other issue with her clothing. And yet her posture and the way that she looks at St. Anthony lets one know her intentions. One last thought before we go. Um, she holds in her hand a cup. And if any of y'all are familiar with tarot, she looks remarkably similar to the Queen of Cups. Here she's, she's not seated, which the Queen of Cups is. She's obviously trying to get something from St. Anthony. And yet she holds the cup in the same hand as the Queen would, and in a very similar way where it's outstretched. And what does the Queen of Cups represent? Well, it's sort of like the world, but... In a, in a less way, it's, it's the promise of all our desires being fulfilled and of reaching a new sense of completion. Her repose, her inviting demeanor, at the background of these nasty demons running around wreaking havoc. If I were St. Anthony and I was in this position and I was trying to read my Bible and pray my rosary, but I'm looking around and I saw these demons running around and there's people getting killed and shit burnt down. And then suddenly this woman appears with her cup, with such a smile on her face. I would have got the hell out of there with her. I said, my Bible can't save me from these demons. From what, you know, they're, they're gonna get me. They're running all around me. And here's this woman with this cup that offers me fulfillment. <clears throat> Thanks for staying around everybody. I hope you vaguely enjoyed this. It's about a half an hour, which is <laughs> it's fucking crazy. I don't know how I talked for that long. But let's think about art. Let's think about visual art. Let's think about its history and what it can mean. Let's take time out of our busy day to get some culture, to get some emotion, and to critically think. Love all y'all to pieces. Thank you for listening.